Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another installment of Con Maciel Carey's monthly webinar series. Today is one of the uh, few times during the year where we do a crossover event with both our labor and employment practice and our OSHA practice. Uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be joined today by uh, two of my colleagues, Jordan Schwartz and Lindsay DeSalvo. I'm Eric Kahn, and today we're going to be talking about a smorgasbord of interesting and unusual um, employee and em employer relationships, the joint employer uh, issue on the labor and employment side, uh, the multi-employer worksite issue on the OSHA side, temporary workers and independent contractors on both uh, OSHA and labor and employment um, uh, aspects of those uh, worker uh, and uh, employer relationships. Um, this is the uh, eighth program in both of our uh, monthly webinar series. We have the 2019 OSHA webinar series and the 2019 labor and employment uh, webinar series, uh, and uh, we're so pleased that you all could join us today. Um, I'll introduce myself real quick and then turn it over to my colleagues. I'm Eric Kahn, one of the founding partners at Kahn Maciel Carey, and I chair the firm's national OSHA workplace safety practice group. Uh, for going on about 20 years now, my practice has focused exclusively on the full range of occupational safety and health law issues. I represent employers in inspections, investigations, and enforcement actions involving primarily OSHA and the state OSH uh, agencies, but also some of the other um, three-letter acronyms out there that get involved in worker safety issues, the Chemical Safety Board, uh, EPA, and MSHA as well. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, to be joined today by my uh, partner, Jordan Schwartz. I'll let him introduce himself and then hand it over to Lindsay. Uh, thank you much. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, glad to be on this webinar with you all. Um, I, unlike Eric, I focus exclusively on the employment practice here at Con Maciel Carey. Uh, and I defend employers in litigation at both the state and federal level and uh, you know, on all sorts of um, the relevant aid, um, employment law statutes, such as the ADA, Title VII, the ADEA, FMLA, FLSA, and, and things of that nature. Uh, I also represent um, public accommodation employers and companies um, when there's any sort of disability lawsuit uh, filed by, by a member of the public and uh, both defend in litigation and advise place of public accommodation uh, on how to make their places accessible. Uh, in addition to that, I counsel employers um, on compliance with uh, federal and state laws as they relate to hiring, firing, um, internal investigations, and disciplinary actions. And, and finally, I do advise uh, unionize, union and non-unionized workplaces regarding employers' rights under the National Labor Relations Act, which we'll talk about um, in a few minutes. And um, this is my colleague, Lindsay DeSalvo. Thanks, Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Jordan said, my name is Lindsay DeSalvo, and I'm an associate at Con Maciel Carey in both the labor and employment and the workplace safety practices. Uh, on the labor and employment side, uh, similar to Jordan, I represent and advise employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship, including uh, wage and hour issues that arise under the FLSA, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which we'll talk about a little bit today. Um, I also review and revise employee handbooks and employer policies related to these types of issues. And then on the OSHA side, um, I represent employers during inspections and OSHA investigations, as well as through the litigation process uh, if an enforcement action is pursued. And then I also help uh, develop and audit safety and health programs uh, related to all types of workers, including those um, that we'll talk about today. Great, thank you very much, Lindsay. And this is Jordan again. And the agenda for today is first, uh, I'm gonna kick us off talking about the joint employer standard and, and where we are there. Um, then um, Lindsay is going to discuss misclassification of independent contractors. Um, and then um, Eric will discuss uh, the OSHA components of the presentation. So with that, let's start with the joint employer standard. And 
some of you may have been on, on these webinars the, the past couple of years where we, we've always, at least in some capacity, touched on the joint employer standard uh, for a few reasons. One, it, it's extremely important uh, from a liability perspective to know whether or not you as an employer may be considered a joint employer. And it's also extremely difficult to keep track of what's going on in, in this area of the law. It, it's really unbelievable how much uh, back and forth um, this, this area of the law, the decisions are, the rulemaking is, and, and everything of, the, of that nature. Um, basically, it, some years there's a 180 degree shift on, on what the practice and policies are coming from a federal uh, level, and other years there's, there's just a slight shift. But um, I, there has not been a year in the past four or five years where there hasn't been some shift about what, what's going on. Um, and, and just to back up for a minute, I just want to make sure you all know what, what I'm talking about, even when I mention the word joint employer. Um, you know, as, I, as I hope most of you know, um, when running your, your, whatever organization you, know, you, you are, um, you may decide to use a staffing firm or a contractor to outsource certain tasks and, and kind of fill in the gaps of your workforce without the hassle of hiring a full-time employee. You know, that, that, that certainly makes sense. Um, the issue, though, is who is the rightful employer of these outside workers? Is it the third-party firm, or is it the company that hires them, or is it both? Um, so basically, when there are two or more associated companies that employ the same staff members and potentially have control over the terms and conditions of employment of those workers, we need to figure out which company will be potentially considered the joint, the employer and or the joint employer. Um, so I'm, there's no way around me giving you some background of what's been leading up to where we are now. Um, that, that's really the, the only way forward so we can, we can actually um, see where we are now. So the old standards uh, for years and years was that entities were joint employers if they shared the ability to control or co-determine matters governing essential terms and conditions of employment, such as hiring and firing, discipline, wages, supervision, and direction. Um, for many years, the, con the control had to be actual, direct, and substantial, not simply possible or theoretical. So really just a relevant um, inquiry um, to analyze your potential liability was whether your company exerted a significant and direct degree of control over a worker. For the starting in around uh, two, 2008, 2009, uh, both states and federal agencies started broadening the uh, joint employer relationship, and that culminated in a 2016, I believe, decision um, called Browning-Ferris. And what happened in Br Browning-Ferris was, was a uh, lead-based recycling facility that used temporary workers from a company called LeadPoint. LeadPoint employees performed different tasks than Browning Ferris's employees and were supervised, hired, and fired by on-site lead point management and HR representatives. However, because Browning Ferris subjected lead point's hiring decisions to its own criteria and reserved the right to dismiss some of the t temporary workers, um, in this case, the NLRB found that the two companies were, in fact, joint employers. And when the board made that decision, they, they issued a statement here that, that's not the most grammatically correct statement I've ever seen. Um, but the point, they were clear in, in making their point. What they said was, we will no longer require that a joint employer not only possess authority to control employees' terms and conditions of employment, 
but also exercise that authority. Reserved authority to control terms and conditions of employment, even if not exercised, is clearly relevant to a joint employer inquiry. Um, the, the, the other thing the board said was that they also would not require um, that, a, that an employer um, actually directly and immediately control the workers. Um, rather, an indirect control through intermediaries might in and of itself be sufficient to establish joint employer status. Um, so basically, the new test after Bro uh, Browning Ferris was that an entity could be deemed a joint employer and therefore um, subject to significant exposure if one, it did not actually exercise any control over terms and conditions of employment, but theoretically could exercise control at some point, or B, did not exercise any control, but rather indirectly exercised control through a third party. So that really caused employers to review their contracts and relationships with staffing companies and outsourcing partners to identify and assess you know, legal risk um, that they were subjecting themselves to. Um, you know, for example, for some outsourcing relationships, companies decided to focus on ensuring that they did not interfere with any hiring and firing of the third party's employees. Um, and with staffing firm workers, companies wanted to make sure that the workers had clearly delineated functions that they were performing um, and clearly um, set forth details of how long the job will be and what the job would entail. Um, even now, even though the, ch the joint employer standard is starting to slightly change, those, those are good business practices that you should speak to your counsel about to, to make sure uh, you, you're protecting your company in, in, in the best way that you can. Um, in t at the end of 2017, and this is where all the, the back and forth really started to occur, is that there was another uh, decision called high brand industrial contractors, which overruled Browning Ferris. And that reinstated the, the prior standard that I, that I spoke of earlier, which is that two or more entities are deemed joint employers only upon proof that one entity had direct and intermediate control over the terms of employment and actually exercised that, that control. Um, you know, in, in this decision, the board clarified that proof of indirect control or control that is limited and routine was not sufficient to establish joint employer relationship. Um, so after this decision, employers started to relax just a, a, a little bit. And, and and not not be so quite as concerned of the super super lenient uh, Brat Brown and Ferris standard. However, that was fairly short lived. As two months later, in, in something that that rarely, if ever, happens, the board vacated its own decision. Um, you know, it was based on the determination um, by the board's designated. Um, ethics official that one of the new Republican members who was um, instrumental in that decision actually had been um, involved in the company's defense of the Brown and Ferris case and as a result should not have participated um, in this matter. Um, based on that somewhat um, you know procedural error um, the the board had no choice but to revert the standard back to the joint employer standard established in Brown and Ferris. So for all the employers that were starting to relax on, on some of the obligations and duties and overseeing um, of what determined joint employer, all of a sudden, um, the, again, the, the, the um, possibility of control was now the new law. The, the, this went on for you know for, for a few months, and then in May 2018, 
um, the um, Trump administration issued a, a regulatory and deregulatory agenda. Um, and as part of that, the NLRB initiated a rulemaking to um, assess the joint employer um, status and to come up with new rules for what that what the standard should be going forward. Um, that is actually still cur currently going on. The the NLRB in and of itself has not set forth a new specific rulemaking. Um, however, um, that leads me to. Uh, right into the next part of what I want to talk to you about, which is what is the DOL um, doing regarding the joint employer standard? As I said, right now the NLRB is in the middle of potentially issuing rules, but it has not done so yet. Now we need to back up just a little bit so I can show you what the DOL is currently doing. Um, but just to take a brief break and answer a question, um, we will be providing the PowerPoint handout, so, so don't worry about that. Um, we'll send a follow-up communication after, after this webinar, and, and we'll provide the PowerPoint. Um, but a, a, as for the DOL, in January of 2016, it issued a memo supporting a new economic rea uh, real realities test for determining, der I'm sorry, for determining joint employer status under the FLSA. And I don't want to get into it too much, but just so you know, the test examined whether a worker is economically dependent on the purported employer. It was not concerned um, only with control. Um, so so that, that, was, that was relevant um, for a little while with the joint employer status. Um, however, as is, as is often the case with these joint employer rules, in June of 2017, so about a year later, the um, then Labor Secretary Acosta announced the withdrawal of the Department of Labor's memo on the joint employer standard. And the, the rescission of this administrative interpretation you know, was hailed by the employer community um, you know, as a step in the right direction, um, but along with the with the NLRB rulemaking um, that, that I just mentioned and, and the new rule that, I'll, uh, that I'm about to get to, it really was just a first step in kind of clarifying um, the Trump administration's position on, on joint employment. And, and interestingly, the DOL actually did emphasize that the removal of, of that administra administrative interpretation did not change the legal responsibility of employers under the FLSA. So, so in some ways, um, you know, you still need to be careful, uh, you still needed to be careful of, of the Browning-Ferris decision. All that being said, we now come to what is, what is currently going on in the Department of Labor and that is really the framework for the joint employer question um, you know, fully. Um, just a few months ago, the Department of Labor announced its intent to revise um, the FLSA's joint employer regulations, which is what you need to be concerned about primarily when you're um, talking about how you're paying the joint employ the employees and whether there's joint employer liability and who's liable for overtime and minimum wage. So, so these are really the key regulations. Um, since the FLSA was passed um, in the 1930s, you know, the DOL has recognized um, that two or more entities could sometimes jointly employ a single employee and therefore share legal responsibility for the employee's wages for hours worked for either entity. Um, you know, despite everything we've just discussed, the DOL had not formally addressed conditions under which joint employment relationships existed since way back in, in the 1950s. So under, under the joint employer rule in the FLSA, the existence of a joint employment relationship 
depends on whether two entities are acting entirely independent of each other and are completely disassociated with respect to the employment of a particular employee. When an employee either performs work that, is sim that simultaneously benefits two or more employees or works for two or more employers at, a di at different times during the work week, the FLSA states that a, a joint employment relationship generally exists if these following factors are, are met. There's an arrangement to share the employee's services. They are acting directly or indirectly in the interests of other employers, or the employers directly or indirectly share control of the employee because one employer controls, is, in, is controlled by, or is under common control with the employer. Um, so that, that's the current rule. The problem with that rule is there's still no coherent test for distinguishing separate employment from joint employment. Uh, there's a, as we've talked about, there's a lot of conflicting case law. So companies operating in multiple jurisdictions face the risk of being subject to joint employer liability in one jurisdiction for the same business practices. Um, and the current language doesn't provide guidance or at least sufficient guidance, and may incorrectly suggest that some employment relationships are always create joint employer relationships, like a franchise relationship. So for that reason, the DOL has now uh, proposed a new joint employer rule that sets forth a four-factor test for businesses that simultaneously benefit from a single employee's work. So this test now examines which business hires or fires the employee, supervises and controls the employee's work schedule or conditions of employment, determines the employee's rate and or method of payment, and maintains the employee's employment records. So no single factor would be dispositive under the DOL's four-factor test. Um, and the standard for determining whether joint employment uh, would remain dependent on the particular facts of each case. But you know, this four-factor test does make some important clarifications and changes to, to what the current standard is. Um, yeah, it, it, specifically, the rule states that a person would actually need to exercise, either indirectly or directly, one of the four um, indicators of control listed in the balancing test I just explained to be jointly liable as an employer under the FLSA. And other factors aside from those four factors would be considered only insofar as they indicate whether a potential joint employer is exercising significant control over terms and conditions of employees' work. Um, interestingly, a worker's economic dependence on a company would not be relevant to, to the joint employer um, a, a analysis. So, so that is um, that is a change. Um, you know, essentially, the revised standard um, is is concerned with that an entity's business model shouldn't make a joint employer status more or less likely under the FLSA. So, this revised language is intended to um, alleviate unnecessary confusion and uncertainty. Um, regarding the, the, the rule in the past. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's supposed to reflect the DOL's position that an entity is acting in relation to an employee and its decision to operate as a franchise or, or utilize sub, subcontractors in and of itself shouldn't be the decision that determines uh, joint employer liability. And um, just to finish up here real quickly, uh, there are some business practices now that previously were identified as making a joint employer status more more likely, and now the, the, these practices would really be um, it, it wouldn't make it more or less likely to be a joint employer. They they would just be neutral, uh, providing a sample employee handbook, allowing an employer to operate business on uh, business on its premises. 
um, you know, participating in joint apprenticeship program, um, even requiring an employer to institute uh, workplace safety practices or sexual harassment policies w w would not be indicative of a joint employer relationship. Um, so the, the rulemaking was open for comment until last, uh, actually two months ago now, um, and, and we are now just waiting to see what the, what the DOL is, is going to say um, in response to all the comments that they received. Um, you know, as a business who might benefit from, from these new rules, you know, just keep in mind that deference to a DOL's rule is not automatic. A court must determine that, that, that a regulation presents, uh, that, that this regulation presents a permissible reading of the FLSA. And right now there's really no um, guarantee that would be the case. I think it would be the case, but, but I certainly can't guarantee that. And also keep in mind that um, state laws, especially California, um, may impose different standards um, than the test that the DOL is proposing. Um, and that's all I have to say. Before um, turning it over to Lindsay, let me just answer, I see two questions here, and let me just answer them uh, pretty quickly. Um, the current DOL employer rule um, states that, the question is, does the current joint employer rule require all three of the items that I stated on my slide for finding of joint employment or any of the three. Um, it is any of the three um, could be required, um, could be enough for joint employment, and you definitely don't need all three. Um, but, the, you know, that rule is being phased out, and, and the new proposed rule um, is the rule that will be coming in uh, going forward. And the last question I have is, can you give an example of indirectly influencing the schedule of a temporary employee? And that would just be if you tell, let's say, that supervisor, you know, kind of give him an, a, a, a wink and say, you know, we really like this one employee. We want him to come in for the best shifts or, or, or things of that nature. You are not actually setting his shift, but you are telling um, his supervisor when you want the employee coming in, and that is certainly in, uh, indirectly influencing the schedule and potentially showing how you have influence over his terms or, and conditions of employment. And with that being said, I am now going to turn it over to Lindsay. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Jordan. Um, so now I'm going to spend some time talking about the issue of misclassification of independent contractors, um, specifically sort of the elements that you go through in making a determination of how someone should be classified, uh, as well as some of the recent guidance we've seen, particularly related to uh, workers in the gig economy. And I hope you all enjoyed this photo of <laughs> Eric's future OSHA practitioners uh, for this next section. So in the realm of independent contractors and, and that analysis, um, the issues that arise usually occur under the Fair Labor Standards Act or the FLSA. And the Fair Labor Standards Act provides for certain employee rights, which I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, including the right to be paid a minimum wage uh, and the right to be paid overtime when employees work in excess of 40 hours per week. Um, the important thing to understand, though, is that the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, does permit certain exceptions to meeting those types of requirements for workers that are properly classified as independent contractors. And this is where the issue of misclassification arises, because workers often are misclassified as independent contractors. Uh, and this could be a particularly significant issue for, um, you know, certain types of workers like temporary workers where it's not always clear um, that they should be treated as employees or that the level of control is there to really consider them employees. If a worker is wrongly classified, uh, he or she could claim significant lost wages if they're, particularly if they made under the minimum wage or if they didn't earn overtime during the period that they worked for the particular employer, as well as other damages 
uh, that are provided under the Act. And this type of claim could be particularly significant uh, if more than one worker is a part of this lawsuit, so if it's a class action. And, you know, because of the fact that multiple workers could be misclassified, um, particularly, you know, maybe in the context of hiring multiple temporary workers, uh, if there is a mis misclassification issue there, we do often see these types of lawsuits as class actions, um, which could obviously result in really significant um, financial damages uh, that the company may have to pay out if it is determined that they weren't properly classified. So in the Obama administration, uh, addressing misclassification of independent contractors was a priority for the Department of Labor. Uh, and one of the ways that they demonstrated that this was going to be a priority is forming the misclassification initiative. Uh, this initiative fostered the development of memorandums of understanding or agreements between the Department of Labor and the IRS, as well as different state organizations um, to provide compliance assistance within the individual states um, to try to avoid some of these misclassification issues as well as coordinating joint enforcement efforts. Uh, the initiative does still exist under the Trump administration, and a majority of states um, do actually have some type of current either memorandum of understanding or other agreement with the Department of Labor to have this exchange of information and provide guidance, uh, though there has been some changes to those agreements from what was originally established back um, during the Obama administration. However, um, as we'll, I'll discuss a little bit later in this section, some of the interpretations surrounding classification of workers have shifted somewhat in this administration. Um, so we'll touch on those a little bit in just a couple slides. So before we get into any shifts in interpretation, um, I'm just going to take a short period of time to review the main elements um, that an agency might look at in assessing whether a worker should be classified as an employee or independent contractor. And these are elements that a federal agency could look at, and so these are also elements that it's important for employers to look at when they're deciding how to classify an employee. There are actually several different tests that are used. Um, the different agencies sometimes have different tests. Uh, the IRS and the National Labor Relations Board um, have different factors that they consider, uh, but the, the dominant one and the relevant one in the context of the Fair Labor Standards Act is the test that's used by uh, the Wage and Hour Division of the Department of Labor. And that's the one that I'm going to review the specific elements for on the next slide. Uh, for the Wage and Hour Division, their goal is to determine whether the worker is economically dependent on the employer. If the worker is economically dependent on the employer, then that worker should be classified as an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. And the factors that I'll review on the next slide uh, have to all be considered together in making that determination. Um, no one factor is going to necessarily be more important than the other. It's a full assessment of all of the elements and then weighing the determinations uh, that the employer or the agency comes to in assessing each element. Um, you know, it could be that the employer makes a decision about how they think a worker should be properly classified and the Department of Labor may disagree with the employer's evaluation, uh, but to the extent that an employer does sort of care carefully consider each of these elements in determining how to classify certain types of workers and document their consideration of how they got to a conclusion on that, um, that can be helpful if a disagreement ever arose to support the employer's determination for how to classify the employee. So these are the main factors that are important to the wage hour division. These are the factors that the wage and hour division would consider in determining whether an, a worker has been properly classified as an independent contractor versus an employee. And the first factor is the employer's uh, nature and degree of control over the worker. And this is going to be um, who sets the pay amount and work hours, who determines how the work will be performed, uh, and whether the worker is free to work for other companies 
uh, while they're also performing work for um, the employer. So an independent contractor has to control the meaningful aspects of the work relationship. Uh, so generally, if an employer dictates how the work should be performed, when the work should be performed, you know, the, the shifts, the hours that the individual should work, that individual worker is more likely to be classified as an employee. But if the worker can perform work for others, even potentially the employer's competitors, um, if they can decide how they're going to complete the tasks for which they've been hired, as well as like the hours that they'll work to complete that task, then that individual is more likely to be seen as an independent contractor. Uh, the second factor is the extent that the work is the extent the work that is performed is integral to the employer's business. So if the work performed by the worker is integral to the employer's business, which means the worker's job duties support the primary purpose of the business, uh, then the worker is more likely to be seen as economically dependent on the employer and not really in business for him or herself. And that is the case where that work would be considered uh, an employee. For example, if the employer is a large retailer, a worker who sells the retailer's product would be more likely to be seen as an employee. But the worker hired to repaint the inside of the store, for instance, or rewire the lights in the store, they are more likely to be seen as the independent contractor because although the work they're performing is important um, for the employer's ability to be successful, it's not actually integral to the employer's business. The third factor is the permanency of the employment relationship. A short, defined relationship suggests an independent contractor status, while a permanent, potentially indefinite employment relationship is more likely to suggest uh, that the worker is actually an employee. The fourth factor, the worker's investment in equipment and facilities. Uh, an independent contractor should have their own business investment in the work and equipment that they have to use to perform the task for which they're hired. So, um, you know, a worker who provides his own equipment to perform the work is more likely to weigh in favor of being classified as an independent contractor. Um, whereas if an employer reimburses a worker for the purchase of equipment necessary to perform the task for which he or she was hired, um, then the worker is more likely to be seen as being an employee of the employer. The fifth factor, the worker's opportunity for profit and loss. Uh, this factor focuses on whether the worker exercises managerial skills, um, or independent initiative and judgment in the job that they were hired to perform that can affect their ability to actually you know, either earn a greater profit or experience a loss. Um, so if the worker can earn more by performing the work more efficiently or suffer financial loss due to his or her inefficiency, then that worker is more likely to be classified as an independent contractor. And then finally, the sixth factor that's considered by the Wage and Hour Division is the level of skill, initiative, and independent judgment uh, used by the worker. If the worker's skills demonstrate that he or she exercises independent business judgment, the worker takes initiative to operate as an independent business in the marketplace, then that person is more likely to be seen as an independent contractor. Um, an important thing to remember related to this element is that an employer should not have to provide the um, worker the skills necessary to perform the task for which they were hired. Um, so they shouldn't, the employer shouldn't have to provide any skills training to that individual. And if skills training is being provided, um, that's something that's going to weigh in favor of the individual being classified as an employee. So although, um, like I said, the DOL's misclassification initiative still exists, um, enforcement of the independent contractor versus employee issue, the misclassification issue, doesn't appear to be as significant a priority in the current administration. Uh, and the Department of Labor under Trump does seem to be shifting its approach and how it interprets the law related to misclassification and determining whether 
a worker is an independent contractor versus an employee, uh, including the expansive definition of who is an employee versus an independent contractor under the Fair Labor Standards Act that was promoted by the prior administration. Uh, specifically, back in July 2015, the Wage and Hour Division published an administrator's interpretation in which it explained um, its analysis that should be used in determining whether someone is an independent contractor versus an employee. In that particular interpretation, the Wage and Hour Division concluded that due to the broad definitions provided uh, in the Fair Labor Standards Act as to the term employ, uh, most employees or most workers are employees or most workers should be treated as employees. Uh, and that interpretation sort of created a presumption that workers should generally be classified as employees. Uh, in June 2017, former Secretary of Labor Alexander Acosta withdrew this interpretation. Uh, he issued a press release uh, that discussed the withdrawal of the interpretation, uh, but really just, it was very simple, uh, just explained that withdrawing the letter didn't actually change the employer's legal responsibilities under the FLSA but didn't really provide more of an interpretation than that. Um, but the decision to withdraw the letter did indicate a uh, potentially narrower interpretation of the term employ and employee um, in this particular misclassification context. Uh, in addition, since that guidance was withdrawn in 2017, uh, the Wage and Hour Division has published additional opinions uh, assessing independent contractor status that do seem to demonstrate a potentially narrower interpretation of who should be classified as an employee versus an independent contractor. Uh, for instance, in a 2019 opinion letter, which I'm actually going to discuss in a little bit more detail in the next couple slides, um, the Wage and Hour Division stated, while the FLSA has a very broad scope of coverage, it is not so broad that all workers are caught within its reach far from it. Um, so that language definitely contrasts with the language of the July 2015 interpretation that created that assumption that workers should, be, should generally be classified as employees. So another interesting and relatively recent sort of wrinkle in the independent contractor analysis is how workers should be treated in the gig economy. So workers in the gig economy are generally hired to complete a short-term specific task uh, directly by a consumer. They're often performing multiple different tasks, although maybe the tasks are, are somewhat similar um, from consumer to consumer. And the connection between the consumer and the worker is often made using a third-party provided platform uh, that facilitates making this connection. Some of you know, the examples of this that we all probably know pretty well are Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, and TaskRabbit. So with the rise of the gig economy, the question of whether these workers are employees or independent contractors has become a really significant one, and one that uh, the Wage and Hour Division did recently address, at least um, to the specific fact scenario provided, uh, and an April 2019 opinion letter. So the situation presented in that opinion, in that opinion letter uh, was a virtual marketplace company who connects workers, which they called service providers, uh, with a consumer in need of assistance with a specific task. The letter goes on to review many of the details related to the relationship between the service provider and the virtual marketplace company. Um, they went over things like the fact that the service provider has to provide some identifying information. They do have to submit to a background check, um, but they sign a service agreement with the company that identifies them as an independent contractor. And then it goes on to largely focus on uh, the different ways that the service providers actually exert control over um, the work that they perform, you know, specifically they exert control as to if they take on any tasks, you know, when they take on tasks, how, and then who they actually provide services to. So in reviewing these facts, 
uh, the opinion letter did ultimately come to the conclusion that the service providers are independent contractors. And they kind of went through in their analysis of why these individuals are independent contractors, those six elements that I discussed a couple of slides ago. Um, I won't go through all of these now, but you know, this slide shows sort of how each of those elements were considered. In the context of control, um, the Wage and Hour Division talked about how the service providers get to choose their hours, get to, can work for competitors and decide if they want to work for competitors, um, that there's minimal, if any, supervision that actually occurs of these service providers by the company who is providing the platform. And so ultimately, in the context of control, the Wage and Hour Division determined that um, it, it tends to lean toward independent contractors or support an independent contractor status. Um, as to investment, the uh, Wage and Hour Division talked about the fact that these service providers invest in their own equipment. You know, they, they pay for whatever instrumentalities are necessary to perform the task. They determine if they need helpers to perform a task and would have to ultimately provide those helpers themselves if they chose to. Um, and so after going through this complete analysis element by element, the Wage and Hour Division ultimately determined that each of the elements weighed in favor of these workers being classified as independent contractors. Uh, the Wage and Hour Division does include a caveat at the end of the letter, which it normally does in these types of opinion letters, you know, that says that the analysis here is very specific to the fact pattern provided. Um, but this does provide some guidance that other companies in the gig economy can rely on to support their own employee classification, um, particularly if the facts for those companies are you know, similar to the facts that were addressed in this particular opinion letter. Uh, in addition, the Office of the General Counsel for the National Labor Relations Board also recently weighed in on the treatment of workers in the gig economy um, <clears throat> in which it considered you know, whether under the National Labor Relations Act, which also has requirements that uh, apply specifically to employees and not to independent contractors generally, um, whether you know, these types of workers would be covered by the National Labor Relations Act. The advice memo was issued in April 2019, and it was intended to address the issue of um, whether these workers are employees versus independent contractors in a few current cases that are actually before the National Labor Relations Board uh, related to a rideshare company. Uh, in the advice memo, the Office of the General Counsel reached the conclusion that the drivers for the rideshare company are independent contractors. And the analysis was pretty similar to the analysis used by uh, the Wage and Hour Division in its opinion letter. You know, similar elements were considered. And the most important um, in the context of this analysis by the Office of the General Counsel was this, again, this concept of control. Um, the fact that the drivers exert control over the conditions of their employment, they exert control over their ability to earn, um, and then they also are providing their own instrumentality, which in this case is the car that they use uh, to perform the tasks required. Unlike the federal government, some states, um, like California, are considering taking action through legislation in addressing the misclassification issue, um, which could be potentially really detrimental to the uh, two companies in the gig economy. Um, and it could also, you know, these states have different interpretations of their own laws. It could be that the states interpret this, you know, differently than the federal government has tended to so far. Um, although the federal government's interpretations of the law uh, seem to be leaning toward qualifying a number of workers as independent contractors instead of employees, uh, companies do have to really carefully evaluate the relationship um, between the company and the worker in the gig economy to ensure that these workers do have the necessary control 
Um, and, the, and again, that economic independence that's so important to the wage and hour division in determining classification. And then just real quick here, um, we provide some recommendations for what uh, employers should do if they are classifying workers as independent contractors to kind of you know, make sure they're taking all steps necessary to have a proper classification. I won't go through all of these right now, um, but at the top, memorialize the terms and conditions of an independent contractor relationship in a contract. You know, a contract's not going to be determinative. Um, the wage and hour division could still certainly come out differently, but um, it is very helpful and good support to have in a contract with an independent contractor explicit term that recognizes them as independent contractors and shows that understanding between the company and the worker. Um, another one that I wanted to highlight uh, is permit the worker to exercise managerial discretion and refrain from providing training. Um, you know, and companies might still have to provide certain types of training under other requirements of the law, like certain safety training, um, but it is important that when a company hires someone to be an independent contractor and perform a certain task, that the company is not providing training on how that task is performed. Um, that's really something that the independent contractor has to know on their own, um, so it's important that uh, companies don't feel like they need to provide that training to ensure the task is performed correctly. And then finally, uh, review policies to ensure that they don't cover independent contractors. It's important not to create any perception that workers are independent contractors, so to the extent that there's policies on vacation leave, sick leave, um, benefits that are offered, those should be strictly limited to uh, employees and not include independent contractors. And with that, I will turn it over to Eric to talk to you all about the Temporary Worker Initiative. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, so now we'll get into a little bit of the OSHA aspect of these sort of less traditional worker relationships or worker-employer-employee relationships. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, OSHA's temporary worker initiative. So we'll start off a little bit with why did OSHA feel the need to uh, implement a temporary worker initiative. This slide lays out uh, OSHA's concerns about the use of temporary workers in the workplace. Uh, and this is, you know, based on a collection of um, evidence and data points and experience from inspections uh, and interactions with, um, uh, with employees, employee groups, uh, and temporary staffing agencies. OSHA became concerned that temporary workers were being used by employers to skirt OSHA Act obligations. This is OSHA's perspective, not mine, but the idea was that oh, well, if these are not actually my employees, I don't have any of the obligations under the OSH Act that would ordinarily run to my employees, so let's use temporary workers more uh, to limit our obligations uh, in the workplace. OSHA also perceived that um, the temporary workers were being used for the most hazardous jobs. You know, let's not put our own, uh, our own employees that we value more or that we have to, you know, we don't want to run off, we want to keep morale high, we want to avoid turnover, so use temporary workers for particularly hazardous jobs is something that OSHA has perceived and stated as part of this initiative. Uh, and OSHA also views that temporary workers are a uh, unusually or particularly vulnerable uh, class of workers in the workplace and particularly vulnerable uh, to retaliation, uh, less likely to raise complaints, less likely to raise concerns, because their role in the workplace is more tenuous than a permanent employee and they're more likely to face retaliation. Often, um, you know, they, you know, OSHA looks at this as a, um, you know, immigrant workforce, non-English speaking workforce, uh, and a workforce that feels less, uh, less emboldened to speak out uh, against an employer's actions or against hazardous conditions, things like that. Uh, OSHA also perceives that uh, temporary workers tend to get less uh, training, safety training, operational training, uh, than do permanent employees. Um, and there's often this sort of, you know, training falling, uh, falling between the gaps between, you know, is the staffing agency providing this training or is the host employer providing the training? And then it turns out uh, that no one's providing the training, and that's one of OSHA's big concerns about temporary workers. And then OSHA, I think, based on anecdotal evidence, not objective uh, data, but, uh, but anecdotally, OSHA has observed and speaks out about um, fatalities and serious injuries that tend to happen 
on day one of a job because of inadequate training, inadequate experience, and lack of familiarity with the hazards that are present in the workplace. And you know, taking that, that a, an injury or a fatality is more likely to occur very early uh, in an employee's tenure at a workplace, uh, that's going to be generally true of temporary workers much more often than permanent workers because they are very new to a, a job, very new to a workplace much more often because they're temporary and they're moving from one workplace to another or, or tend to have that type of work experience. So they're more exposed more often to those early day types of injuries. And then finally, OSHA was concerned that there was going to be a surge in the use of temporary workers, and I think the data did bear this out, because of implementation of the Affordable Care Act and some of the requirements that run to smaller employers as they get a little bit bigger. The more employees you have, the more likely you are to be covered by the obligations under the ACA. So to avoid having employees count towards those uh, thresholds and towards those triggers, employees were likely to use more temporary workers to avoid that. Uh, and that concern was based on what happened in Massachusetts when Massachusetts implemented Romney Care, and I think we have seen that the data supports that as uh, Obamacare has been implemented over the years. So that's why OSHA felt the need to initiate a worker initi temporary worker initiative. So what is OSHA's temporary worker initiative? It is a combination of really all the tools in OSHA's tool belt. Uh, it was initiated during the Obama administration. It continues unchanged today, and it is um, uh, something that OSHA is, is implementing both on the enforcement side and on the compliance assistance side. Um, from a compliance assistance side, we'll talk mainly what we'll talk about in this portion of the presentation is about uh, guidance that OSHA has issued to avoid those issues where you know, who knows who's doing what? Is it the staffing uh, agency or the host employer that's responsible for training, that's responsible for providing procedures, that's responsible for, for providing personal protective equipment? So they've issued a bunch of guidance under this temporary worker initiative. I think there's been 10 memos at this point, basically interpretation letters and guidance documents laying out who should be responsible for those different tasks and responsibilities uh, uh, between the staffing agency and the uh, host employer. And then the other side of that, the other you know, set of tools in OSHA's tool belt other than guidance is enforcement. And a big aspect of the Temporary Worker Initiative has been an instruction to all compliance officers in all area offices around the country that in every inspection that is open, regardless of the purpose of that inspection, incident, employee complaint, program inspection, one of the things the compliance officer should be doing in every inspection is looking to see whether temporary workers make up a part of the, um, of the workforce uh, and, and if they do, to evaluate whether those temporary workers are getting training um, that's required under the various OSHA standards, whether they're exposed to hazards or violative conditions, um, and whether the, um, whether the host employer, even though they are using uh, temporary workers through a staffing agency, meet the criteria that Lindsay was talking about before, about whether you're really the employer. Are these really contractors? Are they really somebody else's employees? Or are they your employees? And if they are, to hold those host employers accountable um, under the OSH Act for violations uh, that, that, would, uh, that, that only temporary workers may be exposed to. So the, the big takeaway from OSHA's um, uh, temporary worker initiative is a focus on joint responsibility. And the, I, and the message here, and this is consistent throughout all of those memos I talked about, through really all of the enforcement uh, that we've seen often where both employers are cited, is that OSHA's expression that both the host employer and the staffing agency are jointly responsible for the safety and health of the, um, uh, of the employees. So host employers need to treat temporary workers as they treat existing employees. Staffing agencies and host employers share control over the employee and are therefore jointly responsible for the temporary employee's safety and health. It's essential that both employers comply with relevant OSH requirements. And then they go on in this uh, guidance and also through their enforcement strategies to identify who, who generally speaking, uh, should be responsible for which aspects of compliance with OSHA standards. 
and there's a common theme that runs through all of these. There's now memos out there about uh, hazard communication, OSHA's chemical right to know standard, uh, the injury and illness record keeping obligations, respiratory protection, hearing conservation, lockout, tagout, and a host of others. And the common theme that runs through all of those memos and all of that guidance is joint responsibility and it tends to be that the staffing agency has sort of a generic higher level responsibility to do generic higher level training, introduce employees to concepts, and then to make sure that the host employer is providing site-specific level training, site-specific level protections. And then obviously because of that, conversely, the host employer has that site-specific obligation. And this is a general rule, and the general rule is based on the fact that the host employer is more likely to understand, more likely to have uh, awareness and superior knowledge about what um, activities the temporary worker will be engaged in, what hazards they may be exposed to, and what, you know, uh, what, what procedures, policies, and equipment is best suited to protect the employee from those hazards. So take hazard communication as one example. There the staffing agency can be responsible for generic HAZCOM training. That is to say, you know, what are the types of chemicals you may be exposed to, the types of hazards they present, what does an SDS look like, how do you read it, what do the different sections uh, mean, but then the host employer has that site-specific obligations like providing accessible uh, SDSs, identifying the specific chemicals or hazard categories more likely that the um, uh, temporary worker may be exposed to and what are the hazards and ways to mitigate against exposures to those categories of hazards the temp worker may be exposed to. And the idea being the host employer knows what chemicals it has on site a lot better than the staffing agency does and knows what um, areas the temporary worker will be working in and what chemicals are present there. It knows where the SDSs are located, how to access them, so it's the host employer that assumes that site-specific level uh, responsibility, uh, unlike the uh, staffing agency that is likely to be less familiar with those. Uh, uh, injury and illness record keeping is a, a, a different um, sort of analysis. The idea there is that for injury and illness record keeping, you know, recording recordable injuries on your 300 log, making reports of fatalities and hospitalizations to OSHA, all under uh, the 1904 section of OSHA's uh, regulations. Th those activities are required to be done by only a single employer. So unlike a lot of these other aspects we're going to be talk talking about, only one employer should record an injury. So there should not be the same injury appearing on the host employer's 300 log and the staffing uh, uh, agency's 300 log should be recorded by one employer, the reporting obligation runs to only one employer, and the guidance that OSHA gives under this temporary worker initiative, which is consistent with guidance it has offered for years under its um, uh, various uh, interpretations and FAQs under the record keeping rule, is that the employer who has day-to-day -day supervision over the worker's activities is the employer responsible for all of the obligations under the record keeping regulations. OSHA says in this guidance that most often that is the host employer, but that's not always the case. So if the staffing agency provides on-site regular supervision, a foreman uh, at the job site who is present, you know, most or all of the time, and who is giving assignments to the worker, who's providing the tools and instrumentalities to the worker, who is evaluating that the work was done correctly, was done uh, on time, uh, that person, whoever that is, whoever that person works for is providing day-to-day -day supervision of the worker and therefore is responsible for the record keeping obligations. Most often that is the host employer, but that's not always the case. You need to evaluate that uh, in your circumstance. And that would be a good area where you're communicating effectively with the staffing agency to say who is going to be ultimately responsible for that. I've got slides now on respiratory protection, hearing conservation, and lockout tagout, but the message here is the same across all of these aspects, the same as it was for hazard communication. And these are all new bulletins. I encourage you to read them if you do have um, uh, temporary workers make up a significant part of your workforce. Uh, the concept is the same across all of these as it was for hazard communication. The staffing agency uh, can and should provide general awareness level training to employees about 
you know, recognizing where respiratory hazards may be present, uh, understanding the types of tools that, that may be necessary and helpful to protect against those exposures, but really the, ob the main obligations under OSHA's respiratory protection standards run to the host employer because the host employer is much, much more likely in a better position to understand where there are um, exposures to potential chemicals, understanding which um, uh, respirators and respiratory protection would be most effective, engineering controls and administrative and work practice controls would be most effective at addressing those respiratory hazards and most likely maintains the respiratory protection program at the workplace. So it's the host employer that carries most of the obligation under that. Uh, identifying which workers are covered by the respiratory protection program, making sure that they're medically fit to wear respirators, and that they are donning uh, respiratory protection as necessary. Exact same analysis for hearing conservation. Uh, for lockout, tagout, uh, the analysis is very similar. The staffing agency has to meet its duty to make sure employees understand uh, hazardous energy and hazardous energy control, uh, and ensuring that the host employer has site-specific lotto program, has machine-specific um, uh, procedures, and provides site-specific training to its temporary workers, to its employees that it sends as temporary workers to the host employer. But it's the host employer who is much, much more familiar, likely, uh, about the hazards associated with and the energy associated with the machines and equipment at its workplace so it is going to carry most of the burden under the lotto program to develop site-specific procedures, to train employees on those procedures, and to ensure that the uh, procedures are being implemented in the workplace. So real quick uh, summing up kind of some best practices under this uh, uh, temporary worker relationship, and I think a lot of these overlap with, uh, with what Lindsay was talking about as well. Make sure that your contract identifies who's going to be responsible for what uh, various aspects of the OSH uh, obligations. Uh, now, a, a contract term is not going to carry the day, but it is going to avoid those situations or help avoid those situations where one employer thinks the other is handling training, the other thinks the other employer is doing it. So avoid those issues of safety uh, responsibilities falling through the gap and helping to steer OSHA to the right employer, if that's the case, but it is not going to be the end-all, be-all uh, for OSHA's determination for which employer is responsible. Uh, I think it's important to provide site-specific safety orientation, whether it's a permanent employee or a temporary worker. The host employer is in a better position, generally speaking, to understand the hazards employees will be exposed to, uh, temporary workers will be exposed to, so they ought to take on that responsibility to provide site-specific training, even if you contract away general training obligations to the staffing agency. Very important to maintain open communications, both with temporary workers, but also with the staffing agency to, to avoid those issues where safety obligations are falling through the crack or safety concerns are being expressed and not heard by the host employer. Um, you know, identify hazards and develop protective measures for those work tasks and those work locations that temporary workers may be working, even if you don't have your own employees working in that area. You are generally, as the host, in a better position to identify hazards in your workplace. So take on that activity. Assess whether temporary workers will be deemed your employees. Uh, you know, Lindsay talked about the various tests that DOL uh, have out there for assessing whether someone is a separate contractor or your own employee. The analysis will be the same. OSHA is going to apply that analysis to determine whether you can be held accountable for OSHA violations. You ought to do that assessment as well. Look to whether you're providing the instrumentalities of the work, you're providing PPE, your procedures are being followed, you're supervising uh, and giving assignments and things like that. And if you are, even if you have this ind you know, independent, separate, you know, temporary worker, uh, staffing agency contract, there's a good chance OSHA is going to treat you as the employer and that can guide you know, what level of involvement you should have uh, in implementing safety uh, policies and procedures as they affect temporary workers. And then review your policies, procedures, and training documents and make sure that they're providing effective protection for both um, uh, your permanent employees and your temporary workers. So with just a few minutes left here, I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay uh, to talk about OSHA's multi-employer 
worksite enforcement policy. So I'll begin by just sort of giving an overview of OSHA's multi-employer enforcement policy, and then I'll actually turn it back over to Eric to close us out and talk about some recent uh, legal interpretations related to this particular issue. So as may be clear by the name of this particular policy, um, a multi-employer worksite is a worksite that has two or more employers working at the worksite toward a common goal. Um, you know, we tend to see these a lot at, in the context of a construction site where you have multiple different types of employers performing different tasks. Um, but it, it, it applies to any work site that has more than one employer um, on the work site. In these circumstances, and pursuant to OSHA's multi-employer enforcement policy, uh, employers can actually be held responsible for uh, exposure of employees to different hazards, even if those employees are not actually employed by that particular employer. And it could even be the case that more than one of the employers could be cited by OSHA and held responsible um, for the hazardous conditions that OSHA finds when it comes onto the work site. So in determining which employer it will cite uh, during an inspection under the multi-employer enforcement policy, OSHA is going to consider first the role of the employers, you know, what type of employer is, are, are each of the employers on the work site, and then whether the employer met their obligations based on the specific role that they have on the work site. So OSHA lays out four main roles in its multi-employer enforcement policy. Um, and this slide shows the first two roles. So the first one here is the creating employer. And as you might guess um, by the description, the creating employer is the employer that actually creates the hazard or causes the hazardous condition to occur. Um, thus, a creating employer can be cited for the creation of a condition that doesn't comply with OSHA's regulations where it does nothing to address the condition. So it creates the condition and then does nothing to address the condition, uh, even if its own employees are not actually exposed to the hazardous condition. For example, um, if an employer, uh, if, if the creating employer uh, damages a raised platform guardrail while they're ho hoisting a piece of scaffold um, up to you know, the structure that they are building, they've now created a hazardous condition. Um, they should be aware of that hazardous condition and then would be responsible for actually um, addressing that hazardous condition in some way. Um, if their employees are on the platform at the time that the guardrail is damaged and so their employees are exposed to the hazardous condition, they could also be uh, the second type or the second main role that OSHA identifies, which is the exposing employer. So the exposing employer is the one whose employees are actually exposed to the hazardous condition. Uh, in the scenario I just described, um, you know, the scaffold is lifted, the guardrail is damaged, and then another employer sends its employees up on that platform to perform some task. Those employees that are on the platform exposed to the hazardous condition um, have now created the exposing employer. And as I already indicated, um, the emp an employer could fill multiple of these roles. So it could be that a completely separate employer on site sends its employees up and then becomes an exposing employer. But uh, as I also previously described, it could be that the creating employer is also the exposing employer if his employees are exposed to the hazardous condition that was created. And then the last two main roles are shown here on this slide. The first is the correcting employer. The correcting employer is the one that's actually responsible for correcting the hazardous condition. Um, so in, in going back to the scenario I provided, this could be the carpentry contractor who was hired to actually erect and maintain the guardrails throughout the work site. Um, that, that employer would be responsible for, um, you know, putting up a new guardrail, making sure that um, if there was a break in the guardrail that it is mended somehow. 
and they could be as they could be cited um, if they don't exercise reasonable care in finding and repairing those hazardous conditions. So if they are responsible for you know, building and maintaining these guardrails, then they have to exercise reasonable care in monitoring the work site, making sure that the guardrails are maintained, and to the extent that they fail in that regard, um, to the extent that they don't exercise reasonable care, OSHA could potentially cite them um, through its multi-employer enforcement policy. And then finally, the last type is the controlling employer. So this is the employer that exercises general supervisory authority on the work site, um, and they also um, have a responsibility to exercise reasonable care in preventing and detecting hazards on their work site. So this is often going to be um, the site foreman who um, you know, has general supervisory authority over the entire work site. The extent of the measures that the controlling employer has to take to satisfy this duty of reasonable care um, is going to be dependent on a bunch of different factors that OSHA lays out in its policy. Um, some of those factors include the scale of the project, uh, the nature and pace of the work, and how much the employer knows about the safety history and expertise of the employers that have been hired to perform these other activities on the work site. So if they have hired someone, some employer with you know, an extensive history of noncompliance with OSHA regulations, then the concept here would be that the controlling employer has to um, exert more supervision, has to take greater measures um, to meet that reasonable care standard of preventing and detecting hazards. On the other hand, if the employer has a really great safety history, you know, has never been cited by OSHA and is really you know, well known for their safety program, then the controlling employer has you know, less, less of a burden to prevent and detect hazards and meet that reasonable care standard uh, because the controlling employer knows that um, you know, this person has a strong reputation of safety um, on these types of projects. So with that, I will turn it over to Eric to close us out and talk a little bit about some recent uh, legal decisions. Yeah, so there's been a couple of developments in the, uh, in the multi-employer context uh, in the courts uh, over the last year or so that we thought we'd bring to your attention. There was this weird carve out in the Fifth Circuit uh, that you know the, the workplaces covered by the jurisdiction of the Fifth Circuit uh, were exempt from the multi-employer policy because of a decision back in 1981 in the Mellorine versus Avondale Shipyards uh, case. And in that case, the Fifth Circuit interpreted, uh, it basically disregarded OSHA's interpretation of the OSHA Act and said, uh, our, our reading of the OSHA Act, the best reading of the OSHA Act, is that employers may only be held liable for violations that affect an employer's own employees. You can't be held accountable for uh, someone else's employees being exposed to a hazard. So ignore the other three categories under the multi-employer test. If you are not an exposing employer, you don't have obligations under the OSH Act. And that uh, precedent lasted for a very, very long time only in the Fifth Circuit. Uh, and in a case in 2017, um, uh, Hensel Phelps Construction, you know, construction is a big uh, ripe um, area for multi-employer issues and multi-employer cases. There, uh, there was a determination that the general contractor had authority to stop work for safety issues um, and so OSHA cited the general contractor as the controlling employer. The Ostrich ALJ and the, and the three, um, uh, three commissioner commission uh, both uh, agreed to vacate or both decided to vacate the citation because the case occurred in Texas and, and it was appealable from the uh, review commission out to the Fifth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit precedent in the Avondale Shipyards case uh, was still uh, good law. And that meant that you know the multi-employer policy did not apply uh, to this workplace in Texas. Despite the administration changing uh, during that case from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, OSHA nevertheless appealed that decision by the Review Commission uh, back to the Fifth Circuit, uh, defending the legality and applicability of its multi-employer policy. That case has been uh, decided. It was decided late last year. Uh, and the Fifth Circuit overturned its precedent. 
and granted the Chevron deference to OSHA's interpretation of the act and upheld the multi-employer policy. And what the uh, court reasoned was that the precedent, the Mellorine uh, uh, precedent, predated the Supreme Court's holding uh, in Chevron that established uh, agency deference, you know, the idea that um, courts and, and uh, uh, judicial decisions uh, should defer to reasonable interpretations by an agency of its enabling statute. Uh, but because the Mellorine decision was uh, issued prior to the Chevron case, the case had to be um, uh, viewed through a uh, uh, be, needed to be re-examined through a Chevron lens. And that's the concept of the Brand X Supreme Court case, that old precedent that was made before Chevron needed to be re-examined uh, and see if it comports with the concepts of Chevron. And the court determined that OSHA's interpretation about application of multi-employer uh, liability uh, for controlling employers and correcting uh, employers and things like that uh, is reasonable. It's a reasonable reading of the OSH Act. Even if it's not the reasoning uh, the Fifth Circuit thinks is the best or most appropriate reasoning, it's reasonable. And if it's reasonable, it's not arbitrary and capricious. OSHA is entitled to deference, and therefore uh, that precedent was overruled, and that means that OSHA's uh, multi-employer policy applies across the country and has another example of a federal court saying that its uh, interpretation is reasonable and under Chevron deference is entitled to stand. So multi-employer is the law of the land. You can be cited for um, violations uh, to, um, th that affect only employees of other uh, employers if you have one of those roles that Lindsay described. Another really interesting decision that was issued this year uh, that I think is worth talking about in the multi-employer context is the Suncor energy decision. And the concept in this case is a subcontractor was working at a multi-employer site, I believe it was a big chemical, a complex chemical manufacturing facility where they were building a new unit or in a, in a shutdown conducting major uh, maintenance in a, in a significant uh, PSM covered unit, uh, that the subcontractor's job was to go inside these massive uh, vessels and inspect welds inside the vessel. Uh, to get access to go inside the vessel to do those inspections, um, scaffolding was erected outside. Uh, at the top of one of these scaffolding, at the entrance to one of these vessels, guardrail was missing from uh, the scaffold. And so under the old working, walking working surfaces standard, that's a violation right there. You're required to provide um, standard guardrails uh, where there is a potential fall hazard. But under the new walking working surfaces standard, you have an option. You can use guardrails or you can use personal fall protection equipment, harnesses and lanyards. Uh, so the big issue in this case was, did the controlling employer, either the general contractor or the host employer, uh, have knowledge uh, or meet its you know, duty of reasonable diligence to, to identify hazards and violative condition by not uh, identifying that fall protection was not utilized for employees that were doing those inspections of the welds inside these vessels. And the ultimate decision by the Review Commission was that the uh, controlling employer, they determined that the entity was a controlling employer, but the controlling employer met its obligations under the OSH Act by doing you know, reasonable diligence, reasonable inspections, reasonable oversight of the work of the subcontractors. And they put into the, identified these three categories to determine whether the employer was reasonable. You look at the nature of the violation, the duration of the violation, and the location of the violation, and you look at those in the lens of a lesser duty, a lower duty that runs to uh, controlling employers than to uh, exposing employers. So, you know, in other words, it, it's, you know, a lower level of diligence is required and therefore the controlling employer is not um, in violation of, uh, is not going to be liable for these fall protection violations, whereas the uh, actual employer of the employees was held to be responsible. But it was also an interesting analysis of that nature, duration, and location issue. They said that the nature of the violation, the ALJ found and OSHA determined that the violation was for the missing guardrail, but that in fact is not a violation because an employer can choose 
fall protection equipment if it, if it would like to. It can choose a harness and lanyard. So the nature of the violation when there was no guardrail was the failure to tie off uh, the harness and lanyard um, uh, to, to provide that type of fall protection. Because that's the, the violation, the duration of the violation was very different. You know, the employee was not tied off for, you know, minutes or at most hours during one of the inspections as opposed to the missing guardrail that was missing for days or weeks during this major um, project. So if the nature of the violation had been a missing guardrail, then it would have been less reasonable to say, I didn't know about the violation because it was days and days without the guardrail. But since the violation was really not being tied off, it was a much shorter duration, so it was more reasonable that the uh, controlling employer did not know that the employees were tied off and that the um, uh, violation was occurring. And then the location was important to the review commission because the violation was not about the guardrail, which is outside the opening and visible to everybody every time they walk by it. The actual violation occurred inside the heater uh, because the employee was not tied off when he was inside the heater and there is no visibility to the inside of the heater unless you are standing up on the scaffold yourself. So that made it more reasonable that the employer did not know uh, that the uh, violation was, was occurring. So these two concepts, nature, duration, and, and location, you've got to look at those uh, to determine reasonableness and then also apply a lower level of expected diligence for controlling employers versus exposing employers. So it was an interesting decision uh, where a multi-employer violation was withdrawn, create some opportunities and potential defenses uh, in these multi-employer cases. So a as I predicted, our hour and 15 minute uh, webinar ran an hour and a half and I'm grateful for all of you for uh, sticking around and joining us again today. Uh, we will, um, if there are some more questions right now, type them into the chat box. We'll address those now, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll get back to you by email. Uh, after the event, uh, I, I also, while we wait to see if there's any more questions, want to encourage everyone to check out our blogs, the OSHA Defense Report blog and the Employer Defense Report blog. Uh, we have a very good article um, on both blogs about these joint employer and temporary worker and independent contractor issues. Uh, we will try to update that um, uh, based on some of the updates we shared today, uh, but please check that out and other updates uh, on those blogs and a couple of events coming up that we want to invite everyone to. Uh, we have, if you are anywhere near Columbus, Ohio on October 1st, please join us for an in-person in regulatory briefing on OSHA, MSHA, and labor law issues. We just launched our um, uh, um, Columbus office earlier this year, so this event is a good opportunity to hear from some government speakers and us about regulatory issues, but also to uh, celebrate the launch of our Columbus office, so we hope if you're in the area that you can join us for that. And then also if your, um, if your job, if your uh, company has um, uh, processes affected by OSHA's PSM standard or EPA's RMP rule, we encourage you to join us in Washington, D.C., October 15th and 16th for the second annual Process Safety Summit. If that's something you're interested in and you haven't seen any info about it, please write to me and I'm happy to, to share some info about that. And then, of course, if you have any questions or if you think of that great question after we hang up today, uh, here's our contact information. Please don't hesitate to reach out and, uh, and contact any of the three of us or any of our colleagues. Uh, we love talking about this stuff, and we'd love to hear from you. So uh, a couple of questions have come in here. One about uh, respiratory protection medical evaluations in particular. The, you're required if an employee is going to wear respiratory protection to um, do a medical evaluation to make sure the employee is fit to wear uh, the respiratory protection. And the respiratory protection won't create some unique hazard for that employee, uh, for example. So I, I would say that the Based on the guidance that OSHA issued, that obligation would run most likely, most often, to the host employer. But I would do the analysis this way. I would say, based on um, you know, who is providing the respirator, who is uh, present at the workplace and assuming the responsibility to ensure that the respirators are clean, that they're being worn, that they are the appropriate respirator, uh, that, that employer who assumes those responsibilities should also be the employer who um, uh, undertakes the responsibility uh, 
to provide the medical evaluations and the questionnaire to ensure the employee can um, safely don respiratory protection. And you know, OSHA has issued this guidance now that there is a presumption that that employer is going to be the host employer because they're most in, uh, familiar with the chemical exposures that may be present, most familiar with the work activities that the temp worker will be engaged in, and therefore uh, what exposures they'll be, um, uh, they may experience and probably has done the assessment already about what is the, the most appropriate respiratory protection. Um, and since they are most likely you know, engaged in that level of site-specific uh, supervision, that they are in the best position to you know, uh, oversee the overall respiratory protection program, which would include medical evaluations and fit testing and things like that. But you know, those are areas where if there is a you know, a, 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 temp, a staffing agency supervisor present and supervising those activities. If it's a specialty task, it's not part of the core business of the employer. Instead, we bring in a specialist to clean out a tank once every 10 years, and that specialist that is a tank cleaning company brings its own supervisors and, and, and oversees its own um, you know, respiratory protection program. That would be a responsibility that could be contracted to uh, the you know the other employer uh, in the mix there, uh, but you know the, the the presumption is the general rule is it will be the host. So I think that's uh, that's everything we've got today. If we missed your question, we will go back through uh, the chat here and identify any other um, uh, any other questions and follow up with you. Thank you so much for joining us again. We hope you'll join us for the remaining webinars in our OSHA and Labor and Employment webinar series. Have a great uh, rest of the summer, everyone.